here. Let's see if it works. Um, so uh, this was uh, written jointly with uh, Sarah Wheaton, who's a finishing PhD student at Durham. Um, I want to talk about pragmatic trials. And roughly a pragmatic trial, uh, I'm probably bringing calls to Newcastle here, um, but uh, uh, is an RCT done in realistic circumstances with fewer eligibility conditions meant to help choose between options for care. That's a quote taken from one of the standards characterizations of it. Um, we know that they're becoming increasingly popular, uh, especially with respect to questions of applicability of, of trial results. Um, for instance, if we want evidence from trials to be used in clinical practice and policy, trials should make every effort to make their trial widely applicable, which means that more trials should be pragmatic and attitude. So that's the reason I want to talk about this topic. Now my strategy today is um, that I'm not going to talk for a very long, it's going to be a very long time, I'm sorry, before I actually talk about pragmatic trials. I'm first going to talk about an ideal trial. Um, there are very many contrasts one could make, but I'll explain what I mean by an ideal trial, um, and then move on to pragmatic trials. Uh, the reason I want to talk about ideal trials first is because the whole point of, one major point of pragmatic trials, the one I mentioned, is that they're supposed to make trial results more applicable in the real world in clinical settings. And um, what I want to say is, unfortunately, they're not doing as much for us as we'd hoped, um, because the limits on the applicability of ideal trials are approximately the same as the limits of the applicability um, of pragmatic trials. So um, <laughs> you, you just, you're just looking at different kinds of, uh, of populations. Uh, it's not as if you're learning something that goes outside the population. So I want to explain what you can do, what you can learn from an ideal trial, and then essentially say, well, same thing from a pragmatic trial. Okay. My theses are um, all studies show results only about the individuals in the study. Okay. Broader applications require information on the study results. I don't mean that you can never make broader applications, but they don't have anything to do with this marvelous design we're also proud of, uh, of the randomized controlled trial. Uh, they, if, if, there's, if you can make broader applications, if you can make conclusions about anybody who wasn't in the study population, that has to be based on information, some other information than the trial result. And that matters because um, we put a huge amount of effort into doing these trials very rigorously. And sometimes I think um, rigor gives out then and we, we have to wing it a lot about the applicability. And it seems to me odd to have so much rigor at the front end of, the, of, of what we're doing and so little at the, uh, at the back end and so little attention to what we can do if we can't have quote, absolute rigor at the back end. Um, so what's so good about pragmatic trials? That's my question. Okay. Uh, along the way, I'm going to um, suggest that ideal, um, which is at the, at one of the standard oppositions to pragmatic trial is a garbled notion. Um, and that trial population selection criteria give a misleading confidence in applicability. So we're always told um, to be sure to say explicitly what the selection criteria for getting into the trial is. Um, that's important to do, but um, how much it affects uh, the applicability of the results outside the trial um, is um, just a matter of what, entirely a matter of what else you know. Okay. So two senses of ideal. Uh, one is the choice of circumstances um, to reveal important features of the treatment and or how it works. So choose the circumstances in the right way to bring out important features about the treatment or how it works. And the other is to choose a homogeneous study population. So I'm going to look at both of these and actually concentrate um, on the second one, um, this one. Um, and the choice of a homogeneous subpopulation is often thought, um, I'll explain why, but it's thought to be a way of finding out, finding out the true causal oomph of the treatment. Now, what do I mean by causal oomph? That's a uh, word that Australian philosophers use. Um, and <laughs> one of the problems is that um, I think we have an idea that there is some, you know, treatments have, um, 
have a goal-directed uh, power inside themselves with a certain amount of push or not uh, towards the outcome. Um, and that um, we think effect size, I mean, people really do talk as if effect size um, or uh, what you measure in an RCT gives you some information about that. So um, I, mean, I can show you a point where I think we can talk about causal lymph and what, uh, what it might actually mean. So, but one of the pe reasons people want a homogeneous, uh, ideal in the sense of a homogeneous study population is to show the real causal lymph. So I'll come to that. Okay. Um, I think the first reason for doing a, quote, ideal trial um, is generally a good one or can be uh, often a good one. And the second one is generally not such a good one. So that's what I'm going to, uh, to come to. So let's look at a case. Um, this is a kind of caricature of a real case I found uh, where we're doing a special kind of um, trial um, we want to make, put. We want to do the trial on an ideal population in an ideal way, in order um, to show uh, what the treatment can do. So um, here's a question. We've got some uh, particular drug, and the, it's thought to enhance the effectiveness of radiotherapy. Um, the theory is that so far um, it takes 30 days for the drug to act in the patient. Um, and it then can enhance the effectiveness of radiotherapy. It doesn't do anything um, until the end of the 30 days, but if you, if, if 30 days later, uh, the hypothesis is radiotherapy will be much more effective than it otherwise would have been. Now, suppose that during these 30 days, generally, the kind of cancer we're treating progresses so that the cancer itself would get worse uh, if we delay the 30 days. Now, um, there are two different ways you can think of testing uh, this drug. Um, the treatment group, well, we know what the treatment group should have. You, you should give the drug on day one and then the radiotherapy 30 days later because that's what's supposed to work if anything works. Uh, but what about the control? Well, here's where we have uh, two obvious choices. Um, you could look at, we're only going to look at people, of course, with the same degree of cancer on day one. And um, the control gives no drug on day one, as opposed to the treatment that gets the drug on day one. And then they get the radiotherapy on day one, which is what you'd normally do then. I mean, if you didn't have this drug in mind, you'd start radiotherapy on that day. Okay? Um, the other alternative is to take the same degree of cancer on day one, no drug, but the control gets the radiotherapy 30 days after, which is just exactly when the people in the treatment group are getting it. So they're comparable in when they're getting the radiotherapy. And on the other hand, their cancer will have progressed. So um, now, uh, I crossed out the use of explanatory, but um, which one do you want to do? Well, if you're interested right now in whether or not this is going to um, the, the level of their cancers, um, you probably want to um, test the drug against starting radiotherapy right away, right? Because you're interested, maybe the effectiveness uh, with which it increases the radiotherapy is totally offset by the progress of the cancer. On the other hand, if you really want to see what the drug is capable of, I mean, can it really make radiotherapy more effective, you'd want to do, um, you'd want to do the other test which is probably not ethical, but I mean, that's the one you'd want to do. And you might want to do that even though at the moment you have to do wait 30 days. Um, you know, the, the theory is that it takes 30 days before the drug becomes effective. But um, that's a piece of information that makes it worth exploring more with the drug to see if you can't get that time period down further. So depending on what, um, what you want to learn um, from the experiment, uh, you pick the control uh, in a different way. And that's by saying um, you pick, um, the, so this is a sense of the term ideal. An ideal um, RCT would be one um, where you, um, you try to find out, um, it's designed specifically in the right way to find out what you're trying to find out. Uh, and if you want to find out whether it's best to use this drug right now <laughs> uh, versus what the, the capabilities of the drug are, 
we design it in a different way. Now, the other sense of ideal, um, which is uh, very common, is that you choose a homogeneous study population. Um, and the, so, in order to think about why you might want a homogeneous study population, uh, and also just in general to think about what you can learn from a pragmatic trial, I want to go back over what's so special about randomized controlled trials to begin with. And we all have a, we all have a pretty strong view what, what's good about them, but I want to do this formally um, because <laughs> it's, it, I think it's important to be precise. Um, so we know um, that uh, RCTs are among their comparative group studies of intervention effectiveness, where you have random assignment to group and we have blinding, hopefully quadruple uh, blinding, and it's um, now. The reason you do the random assignment and the blinding is to try to satisfy what is called uh, formally an orthogonality condition. So I'm going to explain that. Does anybody, can people know, happy with it already? Half of you are, half of you aren't. I mean, how much, how slowly do I have to go? I'll put equation up and you can tell me uh, how much I have to explain, okay? Um, uh, and it's this condition, it's the orthogonality condition that's so special about RCTs, and it's um, to, in order, it's, it's aiming towards satisfying the orthogonality condition, that's the rationale for blinding and for random assignment. And otherwise, you don't have much rationale for random assignment and blinding. So obviously, you, um, you're going to think that orthogonality has got something to do with balance. It actually doesn't. So, okay. so um, what's orthogonality and what's it good for? Okay, what RCTs are good for? Oops. Uh, so we've got two groups, uh, treatments and controls, randomly selected. So you have a study population. Maybe everybody in this room or in the study. Um, remember, my view is that you only learn in a study. You only learn about the study population. And if you want to learn about something else from that, you have to have some other information than the design and the results of the experiment. Um, so we have two groups, and we're randomly assigned to treatment and control. And now, if this orthogonality condition is satisfied, if you take the, if you take the mean outcome in the treatment group and the mean outcome in the control group, that's an unbiased estimate of something called the average treatment effect. The average treatment effect is the average of individual treatment effects. So um, an individual treatment effect is so the outcome we're interested in. How much better am I after I've had the drug and the radiotherapy? So, um, that's, I'm, I'm, going to re, I'm going to represent that by Y. So just you know, how, what my degree of uh, uh, temperature or uh, level of cancer or whatever uh, 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 at the end of the trial is. Um, and the question, uh, the question is my individual treatment effect is, is, is okay, well, what level would I didn't have the treatment, and what level would I have for why if I did have it? And the difference is the individual treatment effect, and how much, how much addition <laughs> to why the treatment gives. And we're hoping it's positive. Is everybody okay with individual treatment effect? And um, and then um, the average treatment effect is called the eight. Um, and um, the different. What's nice is that the difference in means between the y, y value, the mean value of y in the treatment group and the average value of y in the control group, that difference in means is an unbiased estimate of the average treatment effect. And that's wonderful. Um, so what's an 8? I okay, just want to go back over this. An average treatment, <laughs> it's the average individual treatment effect. Uh, so this is, I got, I got in trouble a decade ago with Ian Chalmers for using this equation, uh, uh, but I'm going to keep using it because I think uh, it helps us focus on what's going on. So there's our outcome, okay. and uh, you as a unit like me or Wayne or Sherry, okay, um, a unit in the study population, and we're going to assume that um, y, the y outcome, this linear form, um, you don't use much uh, by using linear. It's due to a lot of stuff, and how much, 
um, what my level of cancer is or what my level of headache is or um, irritability. I often use that as an example of uh, something my daughters are trying to cure me of. Um, the um, level, the, the, all the other factors than the treatment that affect why for me, for a particular unit, that they're all bunched in W. W can be very complicated, have lots and lots of um, uh, factors in it, and you can have a complicated functional form, but they're all in W. And then um, there might be just some um, starting level for each individual. Um, and then the que real question is, is this term really going to be there? Is it going to have, is it going to contribute to the Y value? And if the, if the uh, treatment is totally ineffective for that, that unit, um, X represents the treatment, and this beta will have to be zero, and then it just disappears, and the outcome is caused by everything else, and not uh, not the treatment. Everybody happy with that? Okay. Um, so consider me. Where? Okay. What happens if I would have the treatment? That is, we're going to let having the treatment be x equals one, having the control or not having the treatment is x equals zero. Um, so that's for me, right? Again, I'm just looking at this equation. Um, if, if I would have nothing, x equals zero, um, and subtracting, what we get is the counterfactual difference that the treatment would make for me is just beta. How much difference would it make if I were to have the treatment versus if I were not to have the treatment, everything else is staying the same. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. So that's, that's why... Um, that's why I say that a beta is the individual treatment effect. Um, and now, when I said, um, okay, so now the average individual treatment effect is beta bar, beta average. Um, okay. So, what's so great about RCTs? Well, suppose this condition I call orthogonality, and I just for people to remind people about it. That means in the long run an expectation. But, okay. Suppose orthogonality. That means that the treatment is probabilistically independent okay, of both all the other causes that once represented in W and it's independent of beta. So it's independent of everything, of everything else that matters. Okay. That's the orthogonality condition. If you, um, if you, if that condition is satisfied, then um, you can go back and play around. You can play around with that equation up there, but it comes. It's pretty easy to see that the difference, the average outcome in the treatment group minus the average outcome in the control group, in the long run, the real average, okay, is beta average. Uh, so this, looking at the mean value in the treatment minus the mean value in the control, is an unbiased. Is a is a is an actual outcome then is um, the actual difference in outcomes, average outcomes, is an estimate of the real beta average in the study population. Um, so the difference between the mean outcome of the treatment group and the control group is an unbiased estimate of the study population 8. Uh, that's what the orthogonality condition guarantees. Unbiased estimate. Um, unbiased estimate means that <laughs> If you did this, if you took the same trial population and you randomized it again and again and again and again and again and did the trial and you wrote down the, you know, the difference in means, the difference in means would converge on the real value of the beta average in that population. Is everybody happy with that? Um, now, what's really neat is normally, you know, if you want to do an average of your students' marks, you take the mark for each individual, and you add them up, <laughs> and then you divide by the number of individuals. And, um, but we can't, we don't, there's no way for us to ascertain the individual treatment effect. So you can't do it in the normal way you would, where you just measure each individual treatment effect, add them up, and divide by the total number. And yet, miraculously, I mean, this I think this is what's wonderful about RCTs, is you can find the average without being able to measure, uh, the average of a lot of individual numbers without being able to uh, measure any of the individual numbers. Now, you can share, are you happy with that? You're supposed to smile. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's super. <clears throat> 
And that's because of the orthogonality condition. And random assignment and blinding is supposed to assure the orthogonality condition, that there's probabilistic independence uh, between the treatment and the, all the other causal factors in the free treatment, symbolized by W and beta. Okay. <laughs> Qualifications. Um, if, so all we've done is to show that um, the, the difference, I sometimes call it the, um, the effect size, um, the different discipline zooms of the, the two effect sizes of the rays, um, where uh, in the social sciences, almost always they've got some kind of normalizing factor in the denominator. And um, I just mean, if you hear me say effect size, I just mean the difference in rays between good and evil poor. Okay. Um, so, um, all we know, and all that the, the design of the RCT does is to guarantee, to give you a reason to think, you've got reason to think because you've randomized and because you've um, um, blinded, you've got reason to think that the orthogonality condition is satisfied, so you've reason to think that your effect size is an unbiased estimate of your adverse treatment effect, which is what you'd like to know, but you only know it for a study part. Actually, isn't so much. Um, now, if you drew the study population randomly from the target population, then an unbiased estimate of the effect size in the subpopulation is an unbiased estimate of the effect size in the target population. But more, <laughs> but how often do we do that? So the nicest thing is when you can draw representative sample from your target population, and then you've got real applicability outside the design of the RCT because they're, it's embedded in a slightly larger, one step larger experiment, which was first you do a random draw out from the target population. Also, just to remind you what I said earlier, unbiasedness. Um, unbiasedness refers to an expectation taken over repeated randomizations within the study sample. Um, Usually, on one study population, we do one experiment. Um, maybe I don't um, one. Okay, um, sorry. So, um, and I think that's important to just underline because people often talk as if randomization and randomization and uh, blinding um, is makes. Um, makes it likely that the two groups are equivalent or balanced, and that's not true at all. On any single run, like the one we actually do, there's um, almost certainly it's unbalanced. What we know is that if you did it again and again and again and again, the way it was unbalanced, the means that were coming out of the different unbalanced trials would converge on the true mean. So, um, and that was something that Fisher was quite clear about. You're not getting balance. And randomizing is um, probably not a very good way to get actually get balance on a single trial. Um, you, it seems reasonable to think that at least you'd start off by trying to manually balance the factors that you know matter. Um, and then um, the other thing that's just, um, I didn't know when I started doing this. Um, which is pretty startling. Unbiasedness proof requires um, th that I mean, the way it works, I didn't go through the little bit of algebra for you, but the, you know, to use that orthogonality condition to get you unbiasedness, um, we rely on the simple fact that the uh, expectation of a mean is the mean of the expectation. Okay? And that's not true for other statistics. For instance, the variance, uh, the median or quantiles. And sometimes knowing the variance, the mean, or the quantiles is uh, substantively interesting and sometimes, and sometimes statistically better behaved. Um, so um, it's just important to realize that it's very special when we're looking at, um, uh, looking at the mean. OK, so what um, RCTs and RCT, I mean, just because of the, this wonderful study design, what it can do is 
provide an unbiased estimate of the true average treatment effect of the study of the population enrolled in the study. And if the true eight is positive, then we know that beta is un uh, unequal to zero for somebody in the trial population, at least. In fact, probably from you know a number of somebodies. You can't get an average bigger than zero without the individual treatment effect being bigger. So you know somebody in the study population actually um, has a, a you know, would respond positively to this treatment. Now, pragmatic trials. <laughs> okay, um, pragmatic trials are supposed to be conducted in more realistic circumstances. Um, and we're told you want to loosen the inclusion and exclusion conditions. And you can see why we want to do this. I mean, after all, you do trials on healthy, middle, uh, young men, and then you give the medicine to me. Um, so it's, it, it's perfectly reasonable that we'd like to have uh, had people like me in the trial to begin with. And um, there are various reasons. Um, uh, for having, we all know, this is, uh, this is again, uh, uh, teaching grandmother to suck eggs, right? Um, it's, um, the exclusion conditions are often related to, the, the standard exclusion conditions that we tend to use are related to age, gender, type and stage of disease, previous or current medications, existing medical conditions, and recent participations in a clinical trial. I got that from uh, clinicaltrials.com and more. Now, why inclusion and exclusion conditions? Again, I, you all know this, lots of ethical reasons. Okay. Um, another reason is to maximize compliance. So some people just aren't very good at going through with the treatment, and uh, that messes up your statistics. Um, lots and lots of other reasons. Um, now, in, uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. One study of eligibility criteria said this, um, pragmatics Trials are studies with fewer eligibility criteria, especially fewer with respect to those meant to provide precision, that is, to create a homogeneous population. Okay, so this is why I said at the beginning I was going to talk about homogeneous ideal in the sense of homogeneous populations. Okay, so one thing is to have, um, one thing is to have, to have fewer eligibility conditions, another is to try and get homogeneous population, and I want to look at the, the, the two of those, you know, two different motivations. And why do you want, why do you want, because I, this is um, that um, you would have fewer eligibility criteria, but fewer with respect to those which were meant to give you a homogeneous population. So why did you want a homogeneous population in the first place? What are you sacrificing if you give up on that in order to have fewer eligibility criteria? Is that okay? Are you clear on that? Okay. Um, and when it says a homogeneous population, it means homogeneous with respect to the values of beta and w. Um, so you'd like, in a homogeneous population, you'd like everybody in that population to be the same with respect to only other causal factors that are relevant. Um, now, uh, let's think about why you might want that. So what fixes the average value of beta, the average uh, treatment effect? What, what does it, what, what fixes what value it has? Well, I'm going to use a, a totally non-medical case, which is totally uncontroversial, <laughs> so that we can think about this. Um, imagine that you have a, um, a large, massive charged object, and you're particularly interested in what effect its mass, what effect the, its gravitational power, has on the objects around it. Okay, so we're interested in the effect of gravity on, say, everyone in this room. Um, um, and we know that, I mean, so, and what effect it would be, how much force. Um, how much force does um, gravity, the gravity of this large object, um, uh, produce on each individual in the room? And that's like why. I mean, you know, that's the outcome is why. And why is an effect of uh, a gravitational term, there's that, 
that, there's that mass right there. That's our treatment. Um, we can bring the mass in or take it out. Unfortunately, every time we bring it in, we've also brought the charge in. So we've got other stuff over here that's going on right, that we'd like to control for. But we're interested in we're interested in in this term here. What's the um, effect of gravity on the older objects uh, in this room? Um, and so we know we can write it like this: GMM over R squared. That's the force due to gravity, and then there's the force due to electronic attraction and repulsion, because it's charged. Now, beta <laughs> is, so M is our treatment, and beta is all this other stuff. And then all of this <laughs> is all those other things that don't involve the treatment. So beta equals, sorry, beta equals G, um, M of U, mu, uh, beta of a particular unit, how much force does that particular unit, what's the treatment effect on a particular unit of the gravitational attraction of, of the heavy mass is G, M of R squared for that particular unit. So beta average depends on G, which is a fixed parameter, and the distribution of masses and distances across the room. So if you all get up and move around, the average treatment effect is going to change dramatically. If we um, bring in a lot of overweight people, uh, the average treatment effect is going to change. If, um, yeah, okay, so the average treatment effect really depends on the, um, on the distribution of these other factors, um, and, and um, this is this matters. <laughs> you have to keep this vi vividly in mind right, that uh, when we're thinking about um, ideal trials and exclusion conditions. Okay, so that's I just want to have the picture. Of, um, uh, okay. So why would you want homogeneity with respect to beta? Okay. If you have so let's just go back a second. I'm going to come to say this again, but sorry. Um, G, the fixed parameter. Now, if I were interested in the causal oomph of gravity, I'd want to know G. <laughs> because I mean, I also want to know the formula, GMM over R squared. But um, the, the average treatment effect depends on this, you know, where you're all sitting. And it's not so informative. It's not the real causal oomph. Why homogeneity with respect to beta? If you have homogeneity with respect to both beta and W, then the observed difference in means, I mean, if you just everybody was the same, then you would actually not just be estimating the average treatment effect, you'd actually see it. Moreover, it wouldn't be an average, I mean, it would be an average, everybody would have the same value of beta. Okay. Um, but often when talk, people talk about true effect, what's the true effect? It seems to me more like the pure causal oomph, like G. Um, but remember, beta really depends not just on G, but it depends on these other, what I call support factors. Uh, psychologists call uh, moderator variables, and um, it, economists call interactive variables. I don't know, what, what do you call them? Okay. <laughs> um, so even in a population that has M and R constant, um, the eight, isn't giving you the true causal oomph G, it's giving you uh, a combination of G and M and R. Now, what you can learn from a homogeneous study population then, suppose, okay, so this is going to be a bit complicated, and then I'm almost near the end, but, um, suppose you have a study population that's homogeneous with respect to a set of factors. So everybody in the study population is a woman, professor in the University of London, over 60 years old, lives south of the river, um, or no, lives, uh, where, 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 which is the tube stop that Michael Walnut said uh, quite a long time ago, um, if you get on in the center of London, uh, maybe the city of London, and you move um, each tube stop, you lose a year of life expectancy. Uh, we all live within three tube stops of <laughs> that point. Um, so it's very homogeneous. Uh, uh, so all, okay, so we, it's homogeneous with respect to this set of factors I just laid out. 
Now, if, the, if we're lucky, if we're really lucky, and that set of factors um, really represents beta. I mean, those are the set of factors that interact with the treatment. You know, they're like M and R squared. They're the real factors that really matter to affect, um, to interact with the treatment to uh, bring about the outcome. Okay. Suppose we were really lucky, and those set of factors were the true betas, then the, um, the study eight in that population where everybody's an alpha would really be um, the, the, the observed difference would really be the, the true average treatment effect. So that's why you'd, I mean, you'd really like to get all those conditions down because then you could just find the true average treatment effect. That's super. But, but the problem is that we, we didn't know whether the treatment was effective or not, let alone what all the factors that would affect how effective it is are. So suppose we have a homogeneous population, and it happens not to actually be uh, homogeneous with respect to the true beta. Um, it includes factors that aren't in the true beta or omits some that are. Okay. Then, um, then you don't learn very much from having a homogeneous study population. You don't learn the, you don't learn, um, the, uh, the true eight. Um, what you learn, I mean, what you know, is that if the if the average the true average treatment effect isn't zero, then at least someone, some woman <laughs> who is over sixty and teaches at the University of London and lives within three tube stops of the city of London, um, someone in that of that description was helped by the treatment. I mean, so we you know, we know we can we know we know that we're getting an unbiased estimate of the true eight for that population. What do we know about being a woman, you know, et cetera, et cetera? All we know is that at least one of us who satisfied that description or some number of us were helped. Okay. Um, so it implies, it at least shows you this, that being a woman <laughs> over 60, a woman professor over 60, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't ensure that the treatment is ineffective. And what we know is that some of us it was effective for. But that all that shows about, about women. It doesn't show what the average treatment effect is for women. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't show anything about people who fall under that description, except that we know that it doesn't, being in that category doesn't absolutely ensure that it won't help people. And that's not much to learn. So finally, I'm going to turn to applicability. Um, this is the kind of thing people say. Many users of trial information rely on published journal articles. These articles generally do not reflect the exact definition of the study population as pre-specified in the protocol. Incomplete or inadequate reporting of eligibility criteria hampers a proper assessment of the applicability of trial results. Well, it does, but it's not. that's not the reason. Um, because remember, um, if you've learned that, uh, even if you knew that the true eight wasn't equal to zero, but an unbiased estimate of it, but even if you knew that the true eight was positive, and you knew what the, that the eligibility condition requirements are, those ones I listed, you know, being a woman professor at the University of London, etc., you know those two facts. All you know is that being a woman professor does not ensure the treatment is ineffective. Any further conclusions depend entirely on other information. So, you know, if you write down all those, I mean, you should write them down. If you write down all the uh, eligibility conditions for the trial, you still have a, I mean, it hasn't helped applicability all that much. If you want to help applicability, you've got to bring in from information from outside the design of the trial. Um, as uh, 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 this is a paper I've written with that Thomas Davis Deaton, a rigorously established result whose use elsewhere is justified by a loose declaration of simile is no stronger than a number pulled out of the air. That was actually written by Angus, Angus Deaton um, in our joint paper. Um, so um, that's what I'm worried about. Um, that, um, you know, you do your best to think, um, to describe your study population, 
And some of the reasons you did it had ethical, had something to do with ethical reasons, um, that you had these eligibility conditions. And some had to do with um, trying to make it homogeneous. Um, um, so, um, the uh, a chain of argument is only as strong as its weakest link. That's the, the, that's the point here. So finally, pragmatic trials. We have looser eligibility conditions. Um, we allow comorbidities, other drugs, etc., etc., etc. We have a looser treatment protocol, perhaps. You know, dosages are allowed to shift uh, during the course of the um, timing, perhaps, and so forth. Um, more realistic circumstances. They're done by ordinary clinicians, not people who are really dedicated in the trial and people who are rushed uh, in the way in which you might not be in the RCT setting. We have ordinary patients um, who might not be as compliant um, as others, etc. Now, the bad news again okay, is that RCTs, so you know, we're going to now do an RCT in that clinical setting and we're going to loosen all these. Um, both eligibility requirements and also we're going to loosen the protocol about what constitutes administering the treatment and what constitutes withholding it by you know, letting the timing and the dosage vary. Um, and we're supposed to find out something that makes for greater applicability. Well, the sad thing is RCTs show results about the trial population. And that's all. That's all the RCT can do. Um, and, um, there are weak results of that. Um, now you might think, for instance, you've done it in a real clinic, and um, and you know the clinicians were not so well trained, and um, they're very busy. So you might think that you could conclude, and then still, you still had a, a, a positive uh, average treatment effect there. And you might think, oh, I can conclude at least this. You know, it doesn't matter to have less expert clinicians. That seems a natural conclusion to draw, but you can't, because other things were different in the trial too, and less expert clinicians might have been offset by some positive feature in the pragmatic trial. So, I'm, <laughs> I'm just finishing now. Um, help, uh, this is just the theme I've been going on and on about. Um, if you want to apply RCT results, you have to get the argument for their applicability from somewhere else. And we're really pretty weak on that. And it's harder to do than to do the RCT itself, though it's very difficult to do a good RCT. It's much harder to do, and um, we don't have a, um, a manual <laughs> for <laughs> what to do. And, um, we don't actually invest in trying to figure out what methods are better. Uh, we did invest much in trying to figure out what methods are better, uh, what others, uh, what kind of judgments are necessary to decide whether um, we're doing the right things here. But it's sort of like because we can't do real rigor of the kind you can in the RCT, we're not going to go there. <laughs> uh, so rather than doing uh, um, a, a reasonable job, isn't this the case where the the ideal is the enemy of the good, or the good is then, and what's the expression there? Yes, the best is the enemy of the good. Okay. So, um, help is needed. The true average, if we got a, if we, even if we knew that the true average treatment effect was positive in a study population that satisfied some description, like the professors over 60, um, that doesn't ensure what that shows you is that being a woman professor over 60 does not ensure the treatment is ineffective. Um, so uh, <laughs> what we know from the pragmatic trial, when we had less experienced clinicians and it still worked, is that less experienced clinicians don't ensure it won't work. Um, of course, as I said, you can often support stronger conclusions, but with information independent of the randomized controlled trial. So. Um, Ian Chalmers again asks me, <laughs> would you rather <laughs> have the trial have been done on women than uh, you know, just, uh, if we haven't talked about this, but it's the kind of thing that, uh, I can just hear him saying. He always says, <laughs> wouldn't you rather have, uh, if I'm going to give you a drug tomorrow, would you rather it have been RCT than not? And I said, well, it depends on what you would have spent the money on otherwise. Uh, but, so he said, would you rather? And I think, yes, um, but 
I mean, I, only when I think that there actually is evidence that being a woman might matter, um, and I wouldn't want it to include, just include women, but uh, only on women, and um, then I'd know that if I got a positive treatment effect, the treatment works for some women, um, and some women maybe with a profile like some particular women in the study, we know not which, right? um, and again, um, of course we can sometimes support stronger conclusions, but with independent information. So yes, I mean, you know, my intuitions are the same as everyone else's. I'd like, I'd like to have people like me included in the trial, but I want them to be like me in the relevant respects, which we don't actually know. But, I mean, there are some things I think that we have some good reason to think are fairly regularly uh, important. But you know, we should actually write that down and defend it. Okay, so. I think it's my final slide now. In sum, uh, pragmatic trials are trials. They can do just what a trial can do, give an unbiased estimate of an average treatment effect for the trial population. Our description of that trial population does not show where the results will also hold. To do more, the trial result must be situated in a far larger body of knowledge. The strength of support for any other conclusion depends only in small part on knowing a true average treatment effect in some population, whether it's pragmatic or ideal, let alone what we do know. We don't actually know the true one. We know there's a good chance that uh, the, the average treatment estimate we have is unbiased. We don't even know it's unbiased because we don't know that we've got random number generators actually assigning random, and we don't know that blinding actually did its job. But you know, we've done our best to get an unbiased estimate. Um, those, I said often we have reasonable bets about the other claims that are needed, but it's those bets that's what make our conclusions credible. It's the evidence that backs up those bets that makes our conclusions credible. So, uh, to support credible conclusions, so I'm just going to show you a picture of um, how the RCT, how many people are using the RCT result, and then how I think. So, there's <laughs> the poor little RCT result <laughs> trying to lift this big weight of uh, applicability uh, or of deciding um, uh, uh, what kind of treatments to use all by himself. Um, and I think that's, um, he can't do it, of course. Um, and, um, what he really needs is to work with a whole team of um, other information uh, to, to, to do the job. Thank you. So questions? What do you think about the like additional factor if you've got a very complex intervention as the kind of treatment, which then, I mean, that, some of that I feel like maybe assumes like a more, I mean, everything's complex, but like a simpler treatment. So then how, you know, you're not like a nice equation. It's like, what would you do if it was a really messy intervention as well in the test curve? Well, we know we've got real problems with that, and real yeah. problems with how to design the trial, and which, um, whether you need all of the, um, I was thinking about um, this, so there's, the, in the social the policy realm now, they're talking about complex, we're doing complex interventions in the complex settings, mm -hmm. and um, nobody knows quite uh, <laughs> how to handle those. And there are some standard things you try to do, you I'll try, you, you, you try to vary, uh, um, look for the active ingredients and how do you do that? Well, you either reason or experiment with attrition, and, uh, but it's, it just makes everything much more messy. Uh, and in the social policy realm, um, I'm in favor of, you know, I don't think we, um, we learn, I don't think we learn very much from uh, RCTs about complex interventions and complex settings. What you have to do is get all the knowledge you have and try and do a causal, um, real detailed causal model of what you think is going to happen at each step and then what, what evidence you can um, about whether or not that the story you have about how the co complex process is supposed to work, what evidence you have that actually is working that way or can work that way. Um, and I, um, I have some views, some, I've been working with them on. The, um, the evaluation literature, so there's millions of evaluation journals, 
and um, they're doing post-hoke evaluations, often of complex interventions. Um, and they do sort of after the fact look back, and they do have many of them reasonably good methods for trying to figure out whether it was the intervention made any difference, and then can they find evidence that some aspect or not other of it, um, because you know, they might study the, the whole thing on a case study very carefully. Um, but uh, case study methodology is um, not so popular uh, now. So I'm not, not helping much. <laughs> So what you're saying is that um, if uh, I view RCT and the um, pragmatic RCT are both the same the idea that they still, no matter what their conditions are, they might still include certain um, you, you must still include certain factors that you're not controlling for, and that some factors may bring the results up, some factors may bring the results down, and it doesn't really tell you very much about whether those factors and how which of these factors affect um, whether the intervention is applicable for the particular patient. Uh, not quite, almost. <laughs> um, uh, what I'm trying to say is that. Um, if I was looking at um, trials that are done perfectly, where the orthogonality condition is satisfied, if the orthogonality condition is satisfied, then in the long run, um, the factors that matter, they're unbalanced in each trial, uh, in each run, but they'll, that will average out in the long run. So it's not that, um, it's not that those factors that matter um, are messing us up. It's the, the, uh, the wonderful, the well done trial. They're not messing us up, right? <laughs> They're washing out in the long run. Um, it's that we only know about the trial population and we don't know how to, we don't know what's relevant about that. Within the trial population. We don't know what's relevant about the trial population to know whether you'd have that same result in another population. And we do know something very specific that the, the effect, this effect size that you see in your in the real true effect size in your study population depends on the, the distribution of those other factors and the, the, the interactive factors like you know, some drugs work um, only if you're eating wheat or something. Right. And it depends on the distribution of people in your germ. Um, and unless you know that you know, wheat germ is one of the things that matters, and you can look at the distribution of wheat germ in another population, you don't know have any idea about what will happen in another population. So it's not that it's not that the wheat germ doesn't get, in a sense, take it balanced out in this one. It's that unless you know that it matters. You have no idea what, no idea whatsoever, what, how to use the information about the effect size here. It's not very useful in telling you about what, what are the particular factors that, that can be generalized. That's okay. right. In fact, what you know is you can't. I mean, <laughs> um, medicine is a little bit better off than public health, which is better than other social <laughs> social policies because. Bodies are a little bit the same, right? whereas social and cultural contexts are so very different. Um, so at least you're going in thinking that um, a lot of factors that might matter are the same across the new population as the old one. But when it comes to whether it's something like eating wheat germ, right? <laughs> then um, you know, those things are, are just, you just, I suppose what I mean, I just can't understand why we feel so happy when we get this effect size. And um, the, uh, even Nice says uh, that we ought to have, um, on the first people that talked about, we want to get effect sizes um, because we want to do cost benefit analysis. But the effect size 
depends on this distribution of weak germ and whatever, uh, the distribution where you're all sitting in the room. And that's the very thing that's likely to vary from Birmingham uh, to um, sometimes uh, intent. So I'm really, really worried about too much uh, excess uh, attention to RCTs. I mean, I do see that if you do a large population, I mean, if you've got something that might make a small difference, you can find out that you know, that it did make a small difference in, in some population, which is good enough if you do a randomized controlled trial of a large population. But that, that fact that you could you know, sort of export what the effects all this is from one place to another it seems to me very startling. And you, you often can because you know what the thing is like, but only a small difference here. And, and after all, we kind of understand a bit about how it works, and it really could make a really big difference. But that's all extra, extra information, and we're not subjecting it to the same kind of rigorous assessment of the system of RCT. Sorry, that was a longer answer than mine. I got off on another topic. I'm sorry. Generally, an implicit theory, which is, and, you're, and maybe what you're saying is that the theory should be made explicit. Yes. There's the implicit theory that these these other the plots are going to vary between the, the study population and the, the type of population. It's not does not matter. If you did have a more explicit theory, exactly. and you thought that the, the you know certain ways in which you're worried that the type of population varies with the study population. For instance, the, the clinicians in Skill, then in those circumstances, wouldn't it be helpful to have a more pragmatic approach which did allow those, those other factors to vary within the study population as well? Yes, because you've learned um, something about a new study population that, and if you've got a different age, which is what you're likely to get, yes. you know that um, the two populations weren't the same. You don't know that the don't know, it's the theory that's picking up the clinicians uh, that um, to blame the difference or blame or phrase the difference on um, rather than something some other way the trial populations and circumstances differed that you haven't noticed. So again, it's, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's once you have the theory, um, this is seeing a difference is a bit of a test in the theory. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it just didn't seem like a small thing to be able to rule out the four clinicians. Just the way put it in that negative way. Well, well, I mean, but it, I mean, it's like, um, sorry, I really do want to, I, I think, um, the way I want to think, of it, or just to think about it, and see if this is helpful, is we've got a theory that this is the kind of thing where Clinician expertise doesn't matter, um, say. Um, and you've got some reason for that. Uh, and you might even have a lot of observational studies or studies you've watched clinicians um, actually see that it doesn't, you know, even, even I could do it, <laughs> um, that kind of thing. So you've got a theory, and then you do it in a more uh, standard clinical setting. Becomes clinicians not skilled with that, and you don't see any difference. In that's a, a good positive, it's a test of the theory, and the theory is past the test. If you don't have anything else to back up the theory, if it's a theory you just thought, boy, I really like this treatment, so I'm just gonna hope that <laughs> clinicians don't matter, right? um, then this isn't, uh, I mean, it's only this is only one piece of evidence. Often, and we actually have a lot of other more informal evidence, and it's the reason why we find this piece of evidence so helpful. Is it, you know, it's the thing you can point to, but if, if, if it's all you've got, 
it's not again. It's, you don't know that it's the it's it, that the reason you're getting the same results is the conditions don't matter because something else good might be going on. You move to a population where everybody's healthier or they exercise more or more. If you uh, well, if you rule out the ones you <laughs> yes, I think it's right to be. Uh, you have a right to be skeptical in the same sense in which people insist that you have to randomize after you've done matching. So I'm told um, you want to randomize after you've matched because it's the only way to control for the uh, unknown unknowns. Um, so we've matched on all the, all the things that we think matter. And I'm very skeptical because I'm very skeptical of that observational study because it didn't. I'm not going to. I'm, I'm skeptical of everything. But you know, the, the standard rhetoric is be skeptical of the observational study that did, or the study that didn't do full randomization because there's all this stuff we don't know that might have been messing it up. And it's the same thing uh, here that, you know, I've, I've ruled out all the other reasons that might have, things that might have been compensating for the, the clinicians. Um, but if, if it's a worry, why would, I mean, if, 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 if the fact that there are things we might not know are a worry in the case that drives you to have to do randomization, it's going to be a worry in your case too. And it seems to me that it's an equally troubling worry, but I'm not troubling what we do. <laughs> it's exactly the same issue in the two cases. Does that make sense? Hi. Um, do you think there can be value in pragmatic trials when you consider interventions that can have harms as well as benefits, and those can vary according to the people? So, if, for example, you do it, if we look at the average treatment effect, that doesn't just tell us that it works for one person, that tells us that actually the treatment um, works for more people or has greater benefits than it has harms. So, um, in the study population, yeah. So if we did a trial in a study population of, I don't know, very healthy, simple cases, and you find that actually it helps those people, so for more people in that population, the treatment has benefits than it did harms. But if you take a population that you're more likely to see in the real world with, I don't know, multimorbidity, lots of other treatments going on, and in that population you might find that actually there are more people the intervention harms than benefits. And by doing a pragmatic trial, you get the treatment effect, or the average treatment effect, they'd be more likely to get in the population that you'd find in practice. Yes. And so as a doctor, you get better information on what to do, rather than your trial only done in, I don't know, young white men, um, where you might find that this treatment's brilliant, but actually in the people that you see, then the treatment will be harmful. So doing trials in the population that present in practice, well, which I think pragmatic trials aim to do, can be beneficial. And if you're reporting that, um, my view is that you're going to get different, likely to get different effect sizes. Um, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not quite central in medicine, I'm sort of in the sort of basic um, development of technology and things like that. But, um, that you get, you should expect quite different effect sizes in different populations, unless it's something like something like the Oxford knee. It's pretty clear <laughs> where you should use it and how you should use it and what it is, and you don't get much, you don't expect much variation across populations. And most of us have the same kind of ways with respect. We understand a lot about the Oxford Knee. It's just an example. So, um, but I think you're right that it brings down, it probably brings down the effect size. If the effect size goes up, that would be really interesting. But <laughs> the fact that when you have a different effect size, I think should really make a difference to a, a clinician who isn't being, you know, in our current regime, isn't being helped as much as they might be about um, some group analysis. Um, because we don't have, anyway, yes, <laughs> we don't have as rigorous methods for um, figuring out whether we joke matters or not. Uh, and we do have theories and hypotheses and process tracing and things like that. And um, who 
could spend more effort looking at that evidence more seriously than we did not um, chucking it up. And people are doing that right now. But you begin to have this kind of grading idea, and then it's such inferior evidence that we can pile it up. But it's better, it's better than, it's not fair to the commission when there actually are things that people they don't know but have really thought about seriously. You know, for a clinician, and you're supposed to use your judgment. I just, I mean, I, I, I find this is really irresponsible. Um, uh, that means basic, obviously, to me, because they do say things like that. Well, these are the averages. <laughs> there are averages in a certain kind of population, and clinicians use their judgment in that way. And you're refusing to make available the best information there is on which they might base their judgment, um, and they do know their individual patients, but after all, your whole idea is that you have to actually test things and submit them to scientific inquiry to know whether the kind of thing you think might matter about your patient really does. I'm going to get my, sorry, I'm going to go, I tend to go off and keep going. <laughs> so, we have two more questions. Well, I've been thinking about it. Um, in education, um, sorry, um, there's, I mean, we don't believe in, um, there's a million education journals, and a lot of them tell anecdotal stories. And they're absolutely uh, frowned upon by the Education Endowment Foundation about uh, what works in for education. Um, and you can see the reason for it because. Might have the idea of who's still going to go popular. But I think there's a lot of information to remind out of through a careful review of case studies and doing case studies. There's a lot of, there's a lot you can do with observational studies if you want to do them. They might not be absolutely nailed on causality as clearly as an RCT, but um, then um, there, there's a uh, You're doing, statistic, you're doing statistical studies, you could do causal based nets, and you could do a certain kind of econometric modeling, and the medical community is just uninterested in this. I don't understand why. I tell them we can use these methods, we can't always use them, but they're available occasionally, you can use them, I mean, you don't have the background information. So, we're giving RCTs on one hand. And it's, it's, I shouldn't say nobody's doing this. I mean, you know, the, the buzzword now is not what works, but what works for whom, where. Um, but um, that's partly because people like me, and lots of people like me, have been complaining for a decade um, that we need to pay more attention to this. And now um, it's still the idea about how you might have to go about paying attention to it um, is still sort of stuck in. Narrow view of rigor, which is a broad view of rigor because it's front end, it's front end by the rigor. So you've already, oh, you've already asked the question. Um, just in terms of this additional independent information, which is going to help our RCTs. So there's probably noise, so can I? I probably don't need it, to be honest. <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> for the recording. I don't know whether the noise is from that or okay, the yeah, air um, in terms of the independent information that you say, you know, it's needed to help out the applicability of RCTs. How important would you say is, the, is evidence and mechanism in order to do that? How important is evidence and mechanism in order to, as a, in terms of larger body of knowledge, that helps out RCTs? Well, I happen to be very keen on evidence and mechanism. So am I. EBM plus it. I think that's probably the most important thing. I mean, you know, you can have evidence and mechanism. 
So, yes. Yeah. No, so I was just wondering because obviously one of the biggest problem is how to integrate that into uh, sort of our like, approach towards pragmatic trials, right? Yes. Is that seen as the hardest bit? If we're trying to be clear about this, it turns out that it is what works for in what circumstances. So, there's a, there's a way in which mechanisms can solve a lot of these problems in order to treat an individual based on a study population. But um, I was wondering whether, you know, to what extent, we are even close to integrating sort of echo evidence mechanisms with RCTs in a way that. No? I don't know. Do you know of any work that's good? Not at the moment, but it's getting, it's getting there. John Williamson and Brent Clark are doing some things. So, yeah. Not right now. Brendan Clark is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's, I, I'm at UCLA, University of Washington, and work with him. So. Well, I haven't seen that, so you send it me. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, sure. um, I found it really interesting, and I think it's uh, right that perhaps practitioners should be uh, slightly skeptical about this kind of completely randomized controlled trial information. And in, for practitioners, there is a lot of other information that they can use. But for over-the-counter medicines, how do we make the public skeptical of these type of randomized controlled trials? Because generally, that's the kind of information that they look for. And it's better than not looking for any. And certainly, one of the, um, I don't know. And I don't want to make them too, I don't want people to be too skeptical um, because it is, um, it's a, it has shown it works for some people. Um, and that's and also, we should have some follow up of you know, what kind of harms there were, but we're not so good at that. So that's all seems to me a, a good thing. I don't want people to be too skeptical about that. I just, to be buying, well, you see, they're not the buying. But it's very difficult because um, because people are really busy pushing RCTs, um, and I think they're pushing them because of the other thing. But the other reason is that um, it it does um, sometimes help settle. Um, it's a manualizable method, so if you are doing social policy and um, Somebody's got, and you hire two experts to draw you a um, flow chart of what will happen if this policy is initiated. And one draws one way with a positive outcome that sounds plausible, and the other tells another story which sounds plausible. And you've no idea, you know, one's paid for by the company that, <laughs> except you have no idea which to trust. And then, oh, if, you know. There, we will just look up a book that there's a randomized controlled trial that shows that this works or doesn't work. Then it, it it's a, a thought to be a neutral adjudicator, and it does serve a political purpose. Um, and it might be sometimes better than having to decide between biased uh, uh, modelers, <laughs> but not always. And, Really quite obvious. So, I just want to know: Would you be persistent I think, to really specify what this team of other information is? So, the team, would you say that the team of other information is almost completely dependent on the intervention of the UPM, the situation of the UPM? Because I can imagine people say, "Okay, this is an alternative information. Tell me what it is. Let me put it in flow diagrams." <laughs> yeah. So then it can be. Is it correct that you? I think it's very context dependent what other kind of information would be relevant, but also what other information we can have, what other information we do have, what other, it's how much it costs to do a certain kind of study, um, and what the emotions and the harms in mind as well. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, my question is also about the other chaps holding up the log. Um, and uh, if I understand, I mean, at least part of 
what they're bringing to the law of carrying enterprise is causal information, as I understand it. Well, it could be causal information um, about the target population, the target individual. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, just the, and in the establishing of causal knowledge, isn't the orthodox even going to say, hey, the place to start is with a randomized controlled trial? Um, so, is there a kind of a. Well, that's because the orthodox is just mistaken. Uh, um, there are, if you want to establish, and first of all, um, all this rigor with respect to um, what the, how you do the RCT, and even in a way that he put, even though Ian Chalmers doesn't like it, I think some medical people who do RCTs are happy that they, they're, they're estimating and not they're giving an unbiased estimate of the um, uh, When, um, what they're, even in those cases, Nice example. Well, um, they're still only finding out about causality in that very study population. And they're only finding out about an average that some people were caused by the, um, the, the treatment that happened there. It doesn't tell them anything about causality in the individual or the target or even in an individual who is in a study population. And so um, information about um, uh, how, so Angus Deaton's example, um, I can't remember this one, I can't remember this one, I can't remember went through many drafts, but um, is that um, there are two Catholic schools in um, what seem to be similar neighborhoods in the same city, and one of them's tried the program and it hasn't worked, but it's something that's got a very, very high ranking from the, 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 the Education Endowment Foundation or the U.S. What Works Clearinghouse. Um, what would you do if you were in the second school? Um, if you were at St. Mary's, would you go and look at what happened at St. Joe's, or would you rely on the RCT? And um, so there, one has, again, part of what's doing the lifting is, again, intuitions, loose folk theory, which is what we're doing when we say it might matter when we men and women, and, um, health and health. There's all good reasons for those, but uh, I mean, that's all something that could be pretty explicit. That, um, we think this school is, uh, it's got the same kind of students as ours, uh, same kind of teachers, and the teachers have been recruited from the same pool, Etc. Etc. So I think that my that they're giving me better evidence about what will causally happen here than the RCT is. Um, but that's all a story about what else is doing the lifting, and a story about causality and evidence for causality. Um, and part of the reason for thinking that doing some process tracing over at that other school is relevant, though, has to do with all these other reasons about them having a similar underlying structure that would afford similar. I'm sympathetic. I guess I'm just worried that, that the retort is going to be uh, that it's all well good to have some hypotheses about these factors that make a difference that are born of case studies or folk wisdom or experience or whatever it is. But if you really want to validate that as knowledge, you're going to need to go and do some randomized control trials. And then if we buy into your skepticism, that's not going to be sufficient. It's not, it's not going to solve the problem. You're not, um, and um, the other thing about the, the, I think the face rigor is that um, not only do people not often talk about what they've done as an unbiased estimate of the uh, average treatment effect, they don't tell you what um, the, in, in the social policy cases, um, they don't actually formulate a causal hypothesis. So um, I sometimes quote. Um, you know J-PAL, the General Poverty Action um, Lab, um, these great MIT physicists and economists who, are, who um, are very keen on RCTs, and um, 
Kramer, who did the, um, the, the New Burmese study, uh, I thought something by Duthlo and Kramer, where in one paragraph they conflate um, what I call um, um, individual singular causal claim with a general causal claim with an evaluative claim. So they just they use the term this works, and it's very clear in the same paragraph means they're using it as if they've established that it works generally by having done an evaluation on a specific population from which they're going to be able to give policy prescription for the next country. Um, so the, the, they may be right that to establish a causal conclusion they want an RCT, but what is the causal conclusion they're trying to establish? Can you actually, what causal conclusion can you establish with an RCT? And is it the kind of causal conclusion you need? Um, and um, you know what kind of, you can't establish a general cause of that. You can establish a conclusion which is really a bunch of singular ones. What you can establish is that some individuals in this population got better on, a, if I knew the true eight, right, some popular individuals in this population would get better uh, on the kind of this treatment. And that's really a statement about singular causation, not general causality. This cures. <laughs> this cures in general. Very unfortunate. So, uh, thank you all. Yes. Uh, one second. Yes, um, I want to announce that the RV group started out again, and it's on um, causal explanation in psychiatry. And it's meeting tomorrow, uh, four to six, and it, you can find this on, on our website. And next, colloquium. Is coming up. Well, we have to wait until the second of March, uh, but it's Wayne Martin who's with us tonight, and I hope you come to that. So finally, let's thank Nancy again for her.